Dear subscribers, as you know, we shared many information for you, and we are studying very hard to find current news for you. However, I cannot use this channel for future. Please follow our new channel called As Daily News Report and watch our video to support us. Link in description. Also, you can reach the video we shared on Daily News Report by clicking on the top right button. We highly recommend watching, subscribing and sharing. We will continue to share some news on this channel where we take precautions against some situations for future. Thank you for supporting us. The big poll, how much website access was done with handheld devices? And what was the figure five years ago? I said, well, I'm thinking five years ago was maybe 15, 20%. Now it's maybe 40%. He said, no, before it was 40%. Now it's 65. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the majority is from here. Anyway, the golden hyphen jackass is now very friendly to handheld devices. And it has a wider format. And I just think it's an overall tremendous upgrade. Um, so that's uh, the basis of the new website. And it's a, a fellow in Western Europe who's uh, the manager, and he's a software engineer and um, search, oh gosh, I don't even know what to call it, search technician, marketing analyst. He's a very sharp fellow. Mm -hmm. So that aside, uh, you know, here we are. It, it has been, I would guess, about six years since we've had, five or six years since we've been involved in this pretty enduring painful gold market correction and uh, you know there might be some Elliott wave uh, fanatics out there I don't like I don't disparage them at all uh, there's a lot of legitimacy to it when you when you break into new ground like uh, I would just say an internet stock like Amazon uh, 10 years ago 15 years ago there's no previous history so what governs the big movements in sequence with waves and corrections and Big, grain, big gains. Elliott Wave seems to govern that very well. Hmm. I think we've been involved in a five, six year um, Elliott fourth wave correction. And they don't get big signals with banners and trumpets that it's all ending. We're getting ready to do a, another nice big move up. So what you do, what you have to do is you have to look for the dollar signals. And, and that's what I do. Uh, for the last two years, it's been really since the Ukraine war. Ukraine war was a seminal event. Mm -hmm. That was a major broadcast to the world, mm -hmm. well, our world, planet Earth, um, that the United States has no interest in the global community at all, only in more hegemony, parasitic, fraudulent activity to defend their system. And, and, you know, very little known, Paul, oh, I'm sorry, half dollar, I'm sorry, half dollar, reminds me of the guy named 50 Cent, he's a, he's a black actor, he, he's a lot of fun. He's he is, a, um, he is, that's right, although those are just copper pennies when you add up 50 cents. <laughs> okay, 50 copper pennies, you're a half dollar, okay. That's right, that's 90%, Jim. There, there's a, a factor that's not well known preliminary by a month or two to the Ukraine war. And that was the United States uh, was a signatory on something like a hundred nation accord for the global financial reset to move away from the, the dollar as the global currency reserve, move away from trade payment being exclusively in treasury bills, move away from the dollar and the treasury bond being the, the global currency reserve and banking system and just move toward, move away from the dollar, move toward the gold standard in various agreed upon steps. Okay. And the United States violated the agreement, which was not well publicized. The agreement wasn't publicized and nor was the, uh, what's the word, cancellation, expunging, um, violation of this agreement. Because the United States, with the help of Israel, uh, created the, the Ukraine war. They did the Maidan massacre, the Maidan uprising. 
They passed out a thousand vials of methamphetamine in the square and had police on the rooftops killing people in order to create the chaos. That was done by the Langley boys and the security agency beginning with an M out of that little nation in the northeast corner of the Mediterranean whose name I really don't care to mention much because they're behind the death threats that I received in 2006. Okay, so there's big resistance, and there has been for months and years, for the reset. And, and if you're confused about what the reset is, just think of it as reform of the global monetary system and financial structures away from the dollar, which has no backing, right. which has no sound basis, and a movement towards something that's sound, according to, to say, some people, and, and me included, would say is the Austrian School of Economics uh, teachings and dictums and pronouncements and rules and guidelines for sound money. We don't have sound money and therefore we're having a colossal suffocation globally of debt. And oh gosh, I have, to, I have to mention the debt from the United States. Okay, now you may not like this comment, but it's, it's my reality. I have a lifelong problem of tickly nose and allergies. Um, I, 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 I'm, I go like this a lot and some idiots say, oh, Jim, you got a cocaine problem. No, you idiot. I've got an allergy problem and a tickly nose. Can you deal with it? So, you know, pardon me. When I talk a lot, my nose moves <laughs> and I get a tickly nose. Okay. Not a problem. The trolls lash out at me with every article that I write as well, Jim. Okay. All right. There's a sequence in progress. It's powerful. It has many sides. It's all non-dollar. But let me offer a preface of the U.S. government and the na national finances. Okay. Um, we just had a an announcement of recent U.S. government deficit, and it's really jumped. Uh, and it's for five months. So if you extrapolate, and for people who don't know what that means, you take five months, you take the average of that, and you multiply by 12. Okay, it's not very complicated. It's just a forward movement. If we're on this trajectory, where are we looking, where do we sit at 12 months? We're sitting at $1.3 trillion in deficit. So we'll be moving from 22 to 23.5 trillion. Okay, there's an impression around the world that they'll never be paid back on their treasury bonds. That's why they're dumping the treasuries. And they're also noticing that the Wall Street banks are committing unspeakable fraud with the treasuries. And they're also noticing that the U.S. government is paying for its deficit by printing money, which is what African and South American countries have done with disastrous results. All right, so we've got a deficit that is not being managed. Now remember Trump came in 2016 with a campaign promise to re redo, rework, reset U.S. industrial base. That is a gigantic campaign promise broken. His first act indeed was to increase the military budget by 130 billion after promising to reduce it. So we know who controls the Trump presidency. It's Wall Street and the Pentagon, along with that little nation in the southeast corner of the Mediterranean whose agent, Jared Kushner, is not a good guy. Okay, so that's the deficit. How about the trade debt, the trade gap? Okay. Widening, isn't it, Jim? It, it's, getting, it's getting horrendous. It, it's, it's not just widening, it's accelerating. Okay. It's, it's expanding beyond people's estimations, including my own. And I have a pretty good track record of estimating. Okay, two years ago, a year and a half, you know, they will operate on a fiscal year that ends in September. We had a $650 billion trade gap. Okay, and then suddenly there's new numbers that it's 700 last year or 720. Now we're on track for $920 billion. Now, let me give people an idea of the consequence 
of such a gigantic, unresolvable trade gap because we've not reworked and rebuilt our industry. We still enjoy the offshoring benefits. Okay, this is microeconomics destroying macroeconomics. Let me explain that quickly. Many companies, let's like just say General Motors and Ford, they have truck assembly plants in Mexico. That reduces the cost. They can sell in the U.S. market for a lower cost. But they, they uh, cut out what they call it. They uh, cut jobs. They cut thousands of jobs for the United Auto Workers. And there's lots of layoffs. And there's lots of, uh, you know, uh, un uh, unemployment insurance benefits and they run out after 99 weeks then we call them employed after they run out and it's just it's sickening our economic statistics okay so it might have been good for Ford and General Motors to lower their cost structure but it was a wrecking ball to the US economy mm -hmm. now do that for say several hundred companies multinationals and your microeconomic benefits have destroyed the country by increasing its trade deficit. Let me put the trade deficit in perspective for you. At a $1,300 gold price, if we had a $650 billion trade deficit, that would require, under the circumstances of a gold-backed currency, the dollar, a mm. new gold-backed currency, would say, you know, thousands of tons of gold backing it up. I mean, real gold in vaults <clears throat> that make noise when you stack them. <clears throat> the $650 billion would translate to 13,000 tons of gold forfeited. The U.S. doesn't it's, have 13,000 tons of gold last time I checked, Jim. No, no. Well, we have zero. Um, remember, I said, if we have a gold-backed new dollar, if we have then the trade debt from two years ago, a year and a half ago, would require the forfeiture of 13,000 tons of gold in the first year. And some people say, oh, Jim, but you don't understand the gold price can rise. I said, yeah, I do. I'm a mathematician. If they double the gold price, that means in two years we lose 13,000 tons of gold. Okay, now increase it by 50%. <laughs> We've gone from 650 to 920. It's not quite 50%. That means if the gold price stays where it is at 1300, in the first year we will forfeit 19,000 tons of gold. Hmm. We're working in the wrong direction, and Trump might be recovering the stolen Fort Knox gold by. It was done by Reuben, Clinton, Papa Bush, Wall Street. Langley and the new president in the White House, Clinton. Gosh, I hope these Clintons go away, get put in the ground soon. Um, there was another Clinton murder uh, just two weeks ago. <clears throat> Again, ready to testify before the Congress. Uh, that's a prescription for death by murder. Um, <clears throat> all right, so the United States is not ready for a gold standard. Now, this is a very important part point. Since we're not ready, and since if we do come up with the gold, we will lose it right away, we will not pursue the gold standard. What I'm pointing to now <clears throat> is a forecast, and it's coming into full view, of a dual universe. Now, you may recall some forecasts that I had from 2000. You know, 15, 16, 17, I would say the dollar's going to rise, rise, then rise some more, then vanish. I think you used to say it would <clears throat> shoot up like a firework into the air and then just vanish. Like explode like a firework. Is that what yeah. you used to say? Well, I didn't use that metaphor, but that's the same point. It would just vanish because of the destructive influence of having risen so much. Okay. When Okay, let me give you an example of some smaller countries. Turkey, Brazil, and the Dominican Republic. I know a good deal about Dominican Republic because I got a lady friend who comes from there, and, and I get little reports about you know food price rising. And I said, why the food price rising? She said, because the Dominican dollar has gone down thirty percent since two thousand fifteen. Right, because because that's a good point, Jim. Because when you're talking about the dollar rising, you're not talking about inflation. You're talking about the dollar getting stronger. Correct. I don't like to use the word stronger. 
I like to say the dollar's trading at a higher mark. Okay. Now, why would other countries like Turkey, Brazil, and Dominican Republic have their currency go down? It's not that they're weaker. The United States has the weakest economy, perhaps in the entire world, as far as fundamentals are concerned. Remember, I just cited the $920 billion trade deficit and a $1.2 trillion federal deficit. It's a $2 trillion deficit per year in total. Does any other nation have such numbers? <clears throat> Yet the dollar's rising. I don't say it's strengthening. I say it's rising. Okay. It's rising because we're able to print money and to support it. The Turks cannot. The Brazilians cannot. The Dominicans cannot. Therefore, their food prices are rising and we're wrecking their economies. Okay, so the United States is not prepared for a gold standard, and we're going to do our dead level best to ensure that the dollar continues. Okay. Trade usage and in banking usage for as many countries as we can manage to convince or coerce. Okay. Now, Jim, let me stop you right there. When you're talking about trying to continue it for as long as we can, for as long as they can. Now, I'm looking at things going on, and it seems like every single month I'm seeing a crisis in the gold market. One month, Australia is missing 80 tons of gold. One month we're hearing about, I don't know whose gold it was, ISIS gold in Syria, something about tons of gold stolen. Now we're hearing about Citigroup selling Venezuelan gold. My point is that every month there seems to be a crisis in the gold markets. And every month I'm seeing China and Russia add to their numbers of gold. And are these the types of things that are happening? Because, as you say, it's just one of the ways that they can maintain this dollar for just a little while longer. We need to steal the gold in order to maintain the dollar. Okay. It is so simple. We need war in order to create the chaos, in order to, cre in order to create the conditions for stealing gold. <clears throat> we stole 110 tons of Iraqi gold. We stole 144 tons of Libyan gold. We stole 40 tons of Ukrainian gold. We stole 40 tons of Venezuelan gold, yet we put out propaganda that gold is a dead asset. If it's so dead, why do we work so hard to steal it? That's right. And why are those numbers correlating, interestingly, curiously, with the amount that China and Russia are stacking every month? 40 tons of gold stolen from this country, Russia adds 40 tons of gold this month. These things are just kind of forming these <clears throat> pictures that are coming into focus that say the world is moving away from the dollar and there's not a lot of months left because every month there's a crisis, it seems to me. Is, I, is, I don't, is, I, is my logic there correct, Jim? No, your logic is good, but I, I don't follow the, uh, the, the granular arguments like, oh gosh, Venezuela lost 40, but Russia's up 40. It, it, it's really not that simple. It's more like there's a lot of stolen gold everywhere in the West and there's a lot of increases in the East. And, you know, in a, in a macro calculation on a napkin, yeah, they, they might match up pretty well. But <clears throat> the Russians, okay, this is very important. In 2015, the Russians set up with China, might have been 2014, the Holy Grail, the Holy Grail energy deal. It was a $230 billion, 10 to 20 year uh, contract to buy Russian oil from China. China buying Russian oil. Okay. <clears throat> Got confused with my buy there. It was a big contract set up by the two for China to buy Russian oil. Now, shortly after that was set up, China created the gold oil contract in Shanghai. Futures contract. Russia's been using it. They sell China the oil. They receive RMB. They go straight to the Shanghai um futures contract, and they redeem with gold. Okay, it's an oil RMB contract, and then they use that contract with the oil RM, I'm sorry, oil gold contract. <clears throat> now they completed the triangle. Okay. In March of last year, there's the Petro, the oil RMB contract. So now we have oil, gold, RMB. 
in the triangle in Shanghai. Russia's been using it, and they buy they buy gold from China in Shanghai from the oil purchases. Okay, right. this is new. What you can do is take a few steps back and say the East has now linked gold to the oil trade. That's big. That's very big. It's a dagger in the heart of the petrodollar. You know, Jim, people say, well, that's not big news. People can just go take their dollars and buy gold on the COMEX anytime they want. But everybody knows you can't do that. It is not that simple. There's no gold at the COMEX. They're not just taking their oil dollars and buying gold from New York or from London or from anywhere That's right. else. That's right. In fact, it's it's a little bit more insidious. If Let's just say there's a big hedge fund and they, they want to buy a ton of gold. Just okay. a simple number. Mm -hmm. They want to buy a ton of gold. And I don't know exactly what it's worth. I think it's something like $30 million. They want to buy a ton of gold, so they set up a futures contract. And they say, we want delivery. Let's say... They're doing it. They did it a couple months ago, and it's for a March delivery. They go to the COMEX and say, we got these contracts. We want to buy a, a ton of gold. And they say, sorry, you can't. you got to roll it over. That's the end of the game. That's it. They don't get the gold. They don't get to buy any gold. They don't have any gold in all in a truck delivery. They don't get a ton. They're forced to buy the June contract. And we're, hiking, and we're hiking your margin requirement, so if you can't pony up, then we're going to liquidate no, no, it. No, no, it's not, it's not like that at all. They had their margin requirement. They satisfied all the contractual obligations, and the comic said, F you. We're mm -hmm. not giving you any gold. You must comply by the rules, roll it over into the June contract, or we won't let you in the door anymore. <clears throat> okay, I want to... Okay, you, you mentioned a lot of the pilferage of, of gold. Uh, that is to sustain the gold market where they must, in London, come up with some gold or suffer a big default. I want to have one example. Okay. okay this group of nations, Austria, Netherlands, Germany. They form what the voice calls the nucleus of Central Europe. And he believes that they're going to stick together and boot out the southern broken uh, pigs nations of Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain because they're all indebted and they can't resolve their debt. They can't get out of the trade deficits. They can't get out of the, the government deficits. They're, they're in a bind just like the United States. If you want a list of similar countries to the United States for wretched fundamentals, look no further then Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain, the broken pigs nations. Okay, Germany requested, this was around, I think it was around 2008, following Lehman, they immediately looked to retrieve and repatriate their gold from the New York Fed. It was something on the order of 200, 250 tons. And the United States actually showed disdain and disrespect for a parliamentary delegation from Germany who went, like, let's just think of a group of 10, 10 or 12 people. They went to the New York Fed and said, we want to see our gold, sign the papers, and get this process moving for repatriating our gold. The New York Fed did not even let them in the door. Mm. They were sent home packing. That's not a hedge fund, Jim. That's a sovereign nation. That's a powerhouse, Jim. I know. And and it, it triggered a lot of events that followed. Okay, so how did the United States react to that? They're, they were left with a, like a 220, 250 million, uh, thousand tons. I'm sorry. <laughs> 250 tons of gold. They were left with a request for 200 tons of gold, 250 tons. So how did they react? They started a war in Northwest Africa. They started a war in Chad. Okay. And then they announced that the West was going to be the beneficiary of 70 tons of gold per year from mines in Chad. And all you had to do was do the simple math. They said that... Uh, Germany would be repaid in, in six or five or, I don't know, a few years. 
multiply by the stated output of Chad, and it equaled pretty much exactly the Russian repatriation request. The German repatriation request. I'm sorry, the German repatriation. Sorry. That, that's uh, that's just in time inventory. That's a mad scramble just, to get just gold, Jim. Inventory, yeah, just in time war war sack inventory. Okay, so this is how we're operating to satisfy requirement. I got one other story. This is very close to home, and this involved the voice, it involved the uh, the Interpol, and it involves some very powerful people who put leverage on the London bankers in March of 2013. I'm sorry, March 2011. It ended in 13. Okay, March 2011, I got a phone call from The Voice, and he said, Jim, this is very, very big news. There's pressure put on the London bankers to provide 1,000 tons of gold per month, per month for China. And I asked, what's the pressure and they said well they've got the fraud division special fraud division of interpol involved they got a, a team of very powerful attorneys involved and they've got documented fraud from the creation of the european monetary union that created and set up the euro currency they misused you can use the word stolen i don't like that word they used without authority Chinese gold to set up the entire euro currency illegally. Hmm. Hmm. And China called them on it and said, we want our tonnage back. 30 months later, they stopped. Okay, we're talking about March of 2011 until the end, around September or October of 2013, because I asked at the end, like December, Christmas time, 2013. I said, sir, please tell me, what's the status of this thousand per month? And he said, it ended. It ended at 30 months. And I said, what's the significance of 30,000? He said, that was just the agreed upon amount of tonnage. Okay, so. And, and Jim, people think, you know, my sources are telling me that China has north of 30,000 tons. People say, Oh, no, th there's no way they can have that much gold. Jim, the United States used to have 20,000 tons of gold. You mean to tell me China can't have accumulated 30,000 tons? They're savers, right? They're not consumers. They're savers. They're investors in the yellow metal, Jim. Um, it's so much different from that. It's funny. Okay. Um, China, okay, this is just a little bit of history. Um China has 5,000 years of history for royalty, for joining kingdoms. Um, China itself is a word that comes from Qin, Cheng, Chen, Chuang, Chuang, Sang. They're all variations of the word king. Okay. I had a friend named Cheng, <laughs> David Cheng. He was a friend of mine in 2003 and 4, and he said, Jim, are you aware there are entire villages in China where everybody has the name Chang? <laughs> I said, no. No, I didn't know that. He said, are you aware that if you take the word, the name Chang, with all the variations that I mentioned, plus a few more, because it, it Sang, Chang, Ch Chan, Charlie Chan, uh, the actor from Hong Kong, Chan, Chan. Um, they're all variations of the of the name King. And and he said, Can you guess, Jim, how many people in China out of their total population have a name that's a variation of this word for king? And I said, No. And he said, 350 million. Okay. <clears throat> China is an organization of kingdoms. These kingdoms have been around for five thousand years. Okay. Now, we have, you know, these excavated um, armies made of, of carvings, you know, the, the old, they're, 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 they're museums right now. Uh, it, it's entire armies, like a, a thousand soldiers that are all sculptures. Mm -hmm. The terracotta warriors? or Yeah, all that. Mm -hmm. These are thousands of years old. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, the Chinese have been accumulating gold for thousands of years. Okay. Their kingdoms have been doing so for thousands of years. The name China comes from king. The kings all accumulated gold. The name China is also mainland China, and it's you know it's uh, the central kingdom. It's got a lot of different nicknames. They joined the kingdoms to become the main kingdom. They all joined their gold over thousands of years. I have estimates, the, vo the voices confirm this. I've heard it from several sources in addition. He said, Jim, the Chinese have somewhere between 110 and 120,000 tons of gold. That's four times my estimate, Jim. Yeah. Your estimate, <clears throat> okay, there have been a couple of analysts, uh, uh, McLeod, Alistair McLeod, um, Manley, um, and a couple of other analysts have come up with I think, estimates. I think Bill Holter, possibly. There, there are a few. No, there's, there's several different analysts who have come up with legitimate, step-by-step, -step, systematic accumulation since the 1970s. Just since the 1970s, it's very credible that the Chinese have added 25 to 30,000 tons. Very credible. Um let me give you a little side story. So, so our calculation is not taking into consideration this rich history that you're talking no, about. Not at all. Not at all. You're, you're, you're focusing with that story, which is a good story, a legitimate story. You're focusing on the, the, the last generation. Okay. I need to it, widen my horizon a little bit and think longer previous, term. Not the previous 500. Okay. So if they got 30,000 in the last generation... How much do you think they have in the last 500 generations? Okay, they have a lot. Um, they actually, you know, spread it out. The, the Manchu dynasty that Fulford talks about, there might have been a tremendous amount of gold uh, sequestered in the Swiss banks, for instance, for some of the Asian royalties that weren't China. Uh, Thailand is another uh, royalty setting with a tremendous amount of gold. No one talks about the gigantic Thailand uh, dynasty and gold reserves. Nobody talks about it. Well, maybe one or two, but it's never. I, I hardly ever hear about anything like that. Uh, we do hear about Indonesia being a, a nice hidey hole for a lot of stolen gold. Uh, you know, the Pacific Rim is perfect for hiding stuff. It, it's endless. It's got thousands of islands. I mean, we've got we have the Caribbean. <laughs> We have the Caribbean with a couple hundred islands. The Pacific Rim has maybe 2,000 islands. <clears throat> the entire Philippines. It's called the Philippines because it's the Philippine Islands. Okay, I got a little side story for you. It's gold history. <clears throat> uh, and this is not told in the West, except maybe in the Hattrick Letter and a few other publications that are, seem to have their, their facts and figures correct and their heads screwed on. In 1999, everybody knows that Hong Kong was handed back to uh, the Chinese from the British. The 100-year colony contract ended. But they don't know the side deals. They just figured, oh, we handed it over, and wow, that's the end of it. No, that's the beginning of it. There were side deals. The West, just think the mass of multinational corporations, who some people say control the governments of U.S. and Britain, Great Britain, it's called the United Kingdom, <clears throat> um, and that's, that's largely true. Add in the central bankers and they control the governments. Okay, so what was the deal? We handed over Hong Kong. It's hard to call it handed over. They retrieved their colony, <clears throat> and we acquiesced with a contract, but we had requirements. We said to them, uh, We'll invest a lot in China and help China to reindustrialize, not reindustrialize, but industrialize. And uh, we'll promise, you know, tens of billions in corporate business, foreign direct investment. Think of it as CapEx, plant and equipment. Right. And we, we'll be very generous in transfer of technology. Not completely generous, as you're seeing now, we're, we're fighting over Huawei and ZTE super chips. Okay. So we promised to have a big investment. Just in 2002 and 3, it was 23 billion 
from the United States and Canada. Just two years, 23 billion. There was another deal. We said, the United States said, we want to lease 5,000 tons of gold. And China said, okay, but we're going to do some stipulation and some securitizing of that 5,000 tons. So they did. They created, uh, it's another IRS. Uh, it's an interest, okay, it's not the interest rate swap derivative, but it's an IRS macro secure stream bond. Okay, what you do, just think of <clears throat> your mortgages. I'm going to go from micro to macro. Micro level, you got a, a group of 100 mortgages. You put them together, you got a secure stream of, of payments each month. Of course, there are little default rates, whatever, but you've got the secure stream of 100 mortgages. You create a bond on it. It's called a mortgage bond, and it's called secure stream mortgage bond. Okay, that's a micro example. That was full of fraud in 2003, 4, 5, and 6, and that all blew up with Lehman. Okay, aside from that, we created an IRS macro secure stream bond, and that securitized and collateralized the gold lease from China of 5,000 tons. And we reneged on it. Okay. We defaulted. And in 05, the Chinese said, you've defaulted. The United States said, yeah, F you. What are you going to do? <laughs> so in 2006, China announced, we are going to focus on our United US dollar-based bonds in our Forex account. We are going to focus on treasuries. United States defaulted on the bond and the Chinese said we're going to focus on treasury bonds in our forex holdings of dollar based assets. I read between the lines, I talked to a few smart people and then I read the confirmation. The Chinese are selling Fannie Mae bonds. That was 06. Can you think of an event that happened in 07 and 08 that might have been a climax to that lit fuse? Right, right. The Chinese started the explosion of the subprime mortgage bonds. Okay. Okay, so they announced they were going to focus on holding just treasuries. Therefore, the mathematician says, what are you dumping? It's the mortgage bonds. Okay, now move forward to 2012. After QE, you know, the hypermonetary inflation of, un of uh, unsterilized type. Oh, gosh, that's a mouthful. Unsterilized. In other words, we're going to print money, cover U.S. government debt, and not draw funds elsewhere from the banking industry. That's what Africa did with a bad result. That's what South America did with a bad result. But we're doing it because we're the exceptional nation. And now we call it MMT, modern monetary theory. Right. And, and wrap it in a bow. And it's all blowing up. Okay, but I'm pointing to 2012. Something okay. happened. Okay. We launched okay. we launched QE. <clears throat> then we had QE two and a half or QE light. Bernanke announced that China was going to be converting their long-term treasuries to short-term treasuries. Okay. That was QE. Some call it QE light. Some call it two E Q and a half. What was that all about? Okay, first the Chinese were reneged upon. Then they announced on the gold lease, 5,000 tons or so. Then they announced, indirectly they announced they're dumping Fannie Mae treasuries, uh, Fannie Mae bonds, and that resulted in the explosion at Lehman, which is a whole story in itself. I'll just call it the Lehman event. And then the Chinese further reduce, they're going to go just to short-term treasuries. And now we're told they hold a trillion dollars worth of short-term treasuries, even though they're short-term. What does short-term mean? Five years, two years, one year, and less. And we're told, well, they're waiting for the duration, the maturation of those bonds. When are they going to mature? Never. They're short-term. Are they going to mature? Well, all the two years did. When they did this in 2012, they might have completed the process in 2013 or 14. We've had four years since. How come their treasuries still show a trillion? Hmm. Did they not mature as we were told they would mature? Or was it all bullshit in the accounting? 
I maintain the Chinese are very low in their treasury holdings. They've got lots of deals like, oh gosh, they, 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 they front $10 billion to Angola government to help them with their debt, their government debt. And they're redeemed with $10 billion worth of RMB in the course of the year from oil sales. They do big base and uh, what do you call it? Port facility, military base in Djibouti. It costs a couple of cool billion. They do all these different things in Kenya, in Rwanda. They're doing all kinds of things. They're doing community centers in Nigeria. They're doing all kinds of things. They're spending their money, yet they're still holding a trillion dollars. I think they're stuck on a trillion with the, with the agreement that the accounting will always show a trillion. I think they've done swaps for whatever they've got left. I'll go out on a limb and say they're nearly net zero U.S. dollars. They already moved to short term in 2012 and 13. We, we analyze and say, well, they're going to allow maturity of their bonds and not renew, not, what do you call it, roll it over. Did they or did they not? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we hear all these stories, okay, they bought another $20 billion last month in Treasury bonds. Yeah, okay, fine. I think they are buying some, but I think they're redeeming it in gold. And they're not telling us about it, and that's part of the agreement. They might, they might actually have some Treasury bonds from recent purchases. The, the best way to keep the game going and to keep the available gold uh, on the ramps to ship to China is to continue by Treasury. So I'm a bit contradictory here. I think there's a big effort in the last several years to reduce their, their liability for Treasuries and dollar-based bonds. But at the same time, there's also an initiative to continue the game and continue to buy more Treasuries. But are they not converting the Treasuries to commercial office buildings in the United States? Mm -hmm. They own one-third of all the commercial buildings in something like 20 or 30 major U.S. cities. They're doing the same in London. They're doing the same in Europe. They're doing the same in Japan. Not Maybe not Japan. In, in uh, the Pacific Rim. Okay, so they're investing. I, I maintain they don't have a trillion dollars in treasuries. Okay, fine. Jim, they've Jim. taken their bonds, they've taken their dollars, and they've converted them into real things, real estate, gold. And this is a lot of dollars that are swirling around in the world. If they're buying commercial office property in the United States, if they're making direct investments in various African nations, there are a lot of storm clouds forming with a whole lot of dollars that are about to rain down on the United States, Jim. Well, more like rain down on the treasury bond market, but maybe not necessarily on the, the, uh, the United States. Uh, yeah, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm just, you know, picking at words here. Don't leave out the ports that, in Greece that, that the Chinese bought. And they just made a new memorum, memorandum of understanding to buy Italian ports. So this is American investment, European investment, African investment. Jim, what do you say to the people? When I talk to people that don't really understand money, and I talk about the fact that our money's not backed by gold and silver anymore and all fiat currencies die. I inevitably get that's never going to happen to the dollar. It's already happening to the dollar. That's what I'm hearing you say right now, Jim. Can you explain what this means for people who bust their ass to earn dollars that every month don't even stretch as far? What is coming <clears throat> to these people, Jim? Okay. U.S. citizens are treated to probably the worst, the most biased and tilted mainstream news in the entire industrialized world of 20 nations. You can go to Finland and get better quality news. You can go to Luxembourg. You can go to Portugal and get better quality news. It's incredibly controlled and tilted. When I talk to tourists, I, you know, this is a, a strange thing to say, but several years ago, I turned sour on the Americans in Costa Rica. I got swindled by a couple. One was a friend of mine. I concluded that out of 10 Americans, eight are pretty much worthless. They're drunks. They're dumb. Uh, they come here to, I don't know, the, the skin trade. They, they come here to 
to defraud people. Um, they come here as confidential informants after getting into tax trouble in the United States. I know two of them. Um, so I decided to stay away from them. I have, I have two or three American friends. I have a, a couple of Canadian friends, one in particular. I stay away from Americans, but I, I, I still sample opinions from Americans. At a sports bar, like last night, watching the Michigan game. Wow, what a surprise. What, 16, 18 first half points? Are you kidding me? So I, I got into a conversation with a guy who was watching the game. I could have asked him, but that's a typical sort of person I ask. In the past, not this guy, I, I got I get tired of that. I, I didn't even want to bother asking him about dollar. I wanted to watch the game. I wanted to have a drink. I don't drink alcohol. I had a, you know, a juice drink. <laughs> they got great juices here in Costa Rica. All right, so my point is that I've sampled probably 50 opinions in the last few years. I asked them, what do you think's happening with the dollar? I said, the dollar's strong, man. We rule, man. We rule. We rule. We rule. I said, yeah, are you drunk? No, no. I only had a couple beers. What do you mean we rule? Oh, the dollar's accepted everywhere. I said, oh, really? Why are they dumping them in Russia? Oh, fuck Russia. Yeah, okay, right. Why are they dumping them in China? Oh, no, China's like... We own China, man. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? We buy all their shit. Okay, you know, I talk with dumb Americans. The majority are dumb. I asked them, are you aware of the uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the AIIB? That was three years ago. No, what's that? I said, oh, it's, I don't know. It's about 40 nations uh, looking to uh, industrialize and set up bridges and railroads and port facilities and infrastructure. What's infrastructure? <clears throat> And, and they're doing it without using the dollar. In the last two years, I asked, are you, are you familiar with the Belt and Road Initiative? No, what's that? What? I don't deal with fashion. You know, we talk about it. No, it's not a belt. It, it's the Chinese and their multi-trillion dollar uh, infrastructure projects that have something like 100 nations signed. Oh, I don't know anything about that. I said, then why do you think the dollar rules? Because it's accepted everywhere and it's strong, man, it's strong. Look. I buy more in Costa Rica now than I did two years ago. I said, yeah, it has a higher exchange rate. Does that mean it's strong? And he said, well, obviously, yeah. What's your problem? I said, well, I don't know. I'm just a dumb economist. <clears throat> okay, so I haven't encountered any Americans who know about the non-dollar platforms. I haven't encountered any Americans who understand the Chinese have drawn down by 50% their U.S. dollar holdings, Forex holdings. I haven't encountered any Americans who know what Forex foreign holdings are. I haven't encountered any Americans who understand that the dollar and treasury bonds serve as the basis and foundation of foreign banking systems. I haven't encountered any Americans who understand that the treasury bills are used in trade payment, and that's changing. I haven't encountered any Americans who know jack shit. That's I, my point. I, I have an analogy for that. And it's walking down the street, whistling, <clears throat> enjoying the weather. Nowadays, you're just turned down and texting on the phone. And then, bam, getting smacked on the side of the head with a two-by-four. That's what's coming to these people, Jim. They're going to get run over by a truck when they're crossing the street. Doing text messages. Texting has joined the video games from the 90s. And, and now we're even more a nation distracted. We're even more a nation that's somewhat captured by Facebook. I get told by clients, well, Jim, do you have a Facebook? Why don't you promote your site with Facebook? I said, I don't want to have anything to do with Facebook. They might actually ban me after I develop some kind of a clientele and a little dependence on it for my promotion. They might ban me after it grows. Oh, I don't think that happened. So I asked the dumb American, are you aware that Facebook banned all the, the posts and all the people who were making forewarnings of the Belgian orchestrated terror event in the airport in Brussels and the ditto in the Nice, France organized orchestrated terror event there? Oh no, I don't know anything about that. They don't know anything about what's important. 
Are you aware that Soros, I asked him, is funding the Black Lives Matter movement? No, I don't know anything about that. They don't know anything about anything important. It's really quite tragic. We're dumbing down our nation. <clears throat> I got another funny little story. Remember, it was about a year ago. We had the Black Lives Matter, or two years ago. Black Lives Matter. Of course they matter. I've got a couple of black friends. I, I keep up with them. One of them is involved in a, a nice startup business, and he's in Colombia now, and he's got connection with Western Europe, and he's doing great. He's a smart guy. He's a fun guy. When he's here, he visits me. We go out for a couple meals. Okay, I know what's going on with black folk. And they tell me the same thing. They told me after six years of Obama, they said, you know, black folks, they feel betrayed. They feel Obama is more like a white guy running the white agenda. He had not done shit for black folks. I said, you're right. It took you six years to figure that out. It took me about one. Okay, here's the joke. <clears> the <throat> Black lives matter. Okay, sure they matter. <clears throat> I got a little, <laughs> I got a little, I got a little poster in the, in the email. And it was from one of my clients. I said, Jim, check this out. It's hilarious. It was two dogs. They each had a sign. They each had a sign hanging down around their necks. They're, they're sitting dogs. They're both Labradors. One was a golden lab and one was a black lab. And they each had a sign saying, Black Labs Matter. <laughs> and I thought, that's a keeper. That's a keeper. But, you know, I don't try to make fun of any, any uh, eth ethnic differences. I don't make any racial jokes or slurs or anything. Um, I was brought up, I had a couple black friends. On my soccer team in high school, we had three black guys. They're all on scholarships. So what? They were good guys. Theo, Delbert, I can't remember the guys, the third guy's name. Theo died recently. I just got news. Um, they were both athletic, fast, and good, good guys. Okay. In college, I had, it, it's a segregated society we have in the United States, but when I was in college uh, in the Midwest, I did not have many black friends. The black, the black folks were largely in one dormitory. It, it's, I didn't make the rules. I didn't make, I didn't set up. I had one friend, Todd, and uh, when I graduated or when we moved away from the dormitories, I gave Todd my hat. It was a big leather hat, and Todd was always borrowing it. I said, Todd, give me back my hat. Come on, man. <clears throat> and, and finally I said, just keep it. It's June. We're done with school. You love it. I don't wear it that much. It's just on my show. I know black folks. I don't know a lot of them, but I can relate to them, and they somehow open up to me, and it's it's nice. It means they trust me. Um, this guy who has the, uh, the business with Western Europe living in Colombia now, he's from Texas, and uh, he said to me, Jim, you know, for a white guy, you're pretty nice and pretty level. I said, what do you mean level? You treat me fair. You treat me like a man. I said, other guys don't? No, no, not, not really, no. They treat me with suspicion. I said, okay, fine. Well, you're a smart guy. He, I say to him, and he said, is that why you talk to me? Is that why you treat me well? I said, no, you show me respect too. He, he didn't have a hotel room one time, and, and he slept at my place on the floor. We just arranged a little half-assed mattress, and he was good to go in the morning, took his uh, plane ride. So, I don't want to, you know, build myself up, but I try to be fair. Um, I'm fair on the newsletter, and uh, he doesn't have a he doesn't have a clue what's coming either, too, does he, Jim? No, 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 he does. He's a smart guy. He's a smart guy. I gave him a free subscription. He said, "I read it once in a while, but you know, I'm busy, Jim. I'm I'm, I'm setting up things. I'm trying to build my business, and it's it's tough. And you know, now we get more of these." Uh, uh, foreign tax law things getting in the way. I'm, I'm, I'm constantly having to overcome the U.S. government forms. It, 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 it's bullshit. Jim, it's bullshit. I said, I know it is. I know. They're trying to limit the dollar dumping. That's what they're trying to do. Um, yeah, let me get back to the fi finance point here. You, you said that the whole world is dumping dollars, and that's true. Um, if that's the case, and it is the case, then we must explain my most recent incorrect forecast, I have a lot of correct forecasts, and one that's coming right now, two, two that are coming, is uh, the gold trade note is coming into view, and the Germans are flipping east. Okay. And that's happening in a very big way. I made that forecast in 2015, and I said it's gonna take, it's gonna take two or three years, and, and it has. But uh, the, the stress 
from dumping has not resulted in a rise in the Treasury bond yield. Okay. It was because, from- because when people are selling bonds, the price of the bond goes down, interest rates go up accordingly. They're supposed right. to rise. Right. And, and in this case, they should be rising much faster because it's the whole world dropping those bonds. So that's what you're talking about right there. Continue. That should be the case, but instead we have a rally in bonds. And the and what, when I had a forecast, I said we're, we're heading toward 35 or 4% on the 10-year bond. I showed the chart, but I had a disclaimer in there. I said, but, and it's a big but. <laughs> it is. If Wall Street wants a rally in bonds, all they have to do is create havoc in the stock market. And that's what happened. And that's why we did not get to three and a half. Instead, we're working toward two and a half. We're having a bond rally. Okay, so <clears throat> when the world is dumping their treasuries and, and oh gosh, they have a, a new figure that they they calculate. It's called the last 12 months. Last 12 months for treasury net sales. Okay, some are buying. Japan is on orders with a gun to their head to continue buying treasuries. But a lot of other nations are selling. If you net them all out and look at the last 12 months total each month, you see that we are in a torrent of dumping of treasuries. If that's the case, how come the treasury is showing a rally with falling yield? It's because they've put a... uh, They've they've shaken the wits out of the U.S. stock market. So a lot of professionals running funds, pensions, mutual funds, they're selling stocks and they're buying treasuries. They may not intend to hold treasuries for a long time, but they're buying the treasuries. But now, apart from the stock market, what is the big factor? Better question. Who's buying treasury bonds? We have a 1.2, 1.3 trillion in in, uh, deficits for the U.S. government this year. Where are the buyers? We securitize them with treasuries. Who are the buyers? Okay, if if you look, you'll see there are a lot of financial institutions buying. It does not add up to 1.3 trillion. Who are the buyers? I'll tell you who the buyer is. It's the U.S. government itself. And they're using the exchange stabilization fund and they're using machinery from the interest rate swap derivative. And it relies heavily on the zero cost feeder system of ultra low interest rates. And they put some strain on the system by increasing the Fed funds low, we call it short term interest rates. When you put strain on your zero cost feeder system, it puts strain on the entire machine. The machine is the interest rate swap derivative. I've done a sample. I don't obviously ask the 50 uh, dumb Americans who I meet in in sports bars, uh, do you know what the interest rate swap derivative is? But I occasionally I said, do you know what's going on with derivatives? Well, I read about them once in a while. I don't really know. I don't, well, do you know that that's what they use to fabricate a bond, a bond purchase? No, I don't know anything about that. Do you know we got like like $700 trillion worth of derivatives out there floating as a support foundation for the entire U.S. and Western banking system? Now, I read about stuff. I don't really understand any of it, Jim. Sorry. I, I just don't. Okay. Th- this is very much abstruse, very obscure, very hidden, different, unusual, and not commonly understood. That's the definition of abstruse. <clears throat> it depends upon the free money coming in. Okay, so it's very low interest rate. They can rejigger things in order to make the cost net zero for the feeder system. They're that good. Hmm. I'm hearing that over 75% of all treasury bonds are being bought by the U.S. government through the interest rate swap machinery derivatives. Hmm. When foreign countries, it's, it's their central banks, when China, okay, for instance, when Angola receives $10 billion, just a rough figure, uh, for handling their yearly uh, budget, and it's all in treasuries, they sell it in the open market. Who buys it? 
and and there are more buyers than sellers because the rates coming down, the interest rate, I mean the bond yield is coming down. There's a lot of dumping, but there's a tremendous amount of U.S. government purchase of its own debt. Now, if you look at the financial history in the last 50 years for planet Earth, every single country that bought its own debt saw a currency crisis. The United States is preventing, precluding a currency crisis by forcing through sanctions and other means the rest of the world to continue using the dollar and trade, while locally in the United States we're using the interest rate swap derivative to maintain the course. We're buying time. And a lot of clients ask me, Jim, when, okay, it's a time question, when will this all fracture? And you might be you know, working your way up to this question yourself. I answer the question, when will this all fracture? When will the dollar experience its currency crisis? When will the United States experience its massive financial troubles? And I say the process began a few months ago for fracture. Now, I'm asked often, well, what, what do you mean? I, I didn't hear anything in the news about fracture. I get a lot of questions from bright people who are Hattrick Letter subscribers, and they're not noticing the fractures. Here's one. General Electric just got downgraded to triple B bond. That's a fracture. They were considered, when I started this newsletter in 04 and 05, General Electric, not General Electric, General Electric was considered the number one financial corporation in the United States. They had steady earnings. They were so steady in meeting the analyst estimates that there were rumors and a lot of stories that they were managing their earnings by lowering them a few pennies this quarter, raising them a few pennies next quarter by use of derivatives. I contend that they got bitten by derivatives and now they're being, not bitten, they're being slammed with a sledgehammer by the U.S. economy. They got downgraded to triple B. And here's, here's some facts about these triple B bonds. There used to be 600 billion, 550, 600 billion back at the layman event in triple B's. You want to take a guess how many, what the volume of triple B bonds in the United States is right now? I'm sure it's several multiples higher. It's 2.8 trillion. Okay, I contend that a fracture is coming with U.S. corporate bonds. Okay. It's going to reflect on the U.S. bond market in a general sense. And that means it's going to have a shadow impact. Think of a tiger's tail. No, I just saw a movie a few days ago. It was a dinosaur. You know, I like watching uh, Jurassic Park. There's several. The most recent was Super with, uh, oh, I can't think. Uh, it, it's Ron Howard's daughter, uh, Bryce, Dallas Bryce Howard. Anyway, Bryce <laughs> Dallas Howard. She's a cutie. She's a redhead. Uh, <clears throat> the dinosaur when it lunged forward to hit a target, might miss, but never pass the opportunity to whip that tail. The tail is part of its structure because it's got a lot of weight in the neck and head and the upper torso, and the tail balances it out so that it can walk and run. The tail is a weapon, whack. I believe the, the downgrades from Triple B we now have 2.8 trillion or 2.3 trillion dollars of triple B. They're going to get downgraded. I got I got two jackass colleagues uh, who tell me, Jim, I fully expect in the next 12 to 18 months we're going to have downgrades of about a trillion dollars of triple B to junk of U.S. corporate bonds. Now, some people might say, well, you know, big deal. It's not treasuries. Well, it is a big deal because these are the pillars upon which the U.S. economy is the platform, and the U.S. government rests with a throne atop that. When these companies suffer the, 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 the disgrace of going to triple B, they're still 
in a position to be owned by mutual funds and pension funds. But they drop in their ability to raise more bonds through the bond market and their issuance dries up. And they must go to the banks and say, we must set up a revolver account. Think of it as a corporate level type household credit card. So they must do the revolver. In other words, what's your payment this month? What's your payment next month? Here's the amount toward principal. Here's your amount toward interest and the interest is higher. Whereas in the bond market, you float a new bond, you get a very nice low interest rate. And if you run out of money, you float another bond in four months and you get a very nice interest rate. That's all gone. It's all gone when you go to triple B. So we've got a lot of what they call fallen angels. General Electric is the poster boy of fallen angels. They're now in the disgraceful category of triple B. If they go to triple B minus, they suddenly are sold all over the place in mutual funds and pension funds. <clears throat> when, you, when you go to triple B, it's like you're going to the waiting room for the funeral parlor. <clears throat> you suffer the disgrace. General, Mo General Electric stock is down something like 60%. They lost $100 billion in market cap. I wrote it up several months ago on the Hattrick letter. Not much in the news, the market cap loss. It's enormous. If they go to triple, uh, double B, I'm sorry, B minus or whatever it's called, the next step down, uh, I put it on the wall, I can't find it. Uh, if, they, if they go to triple, if they go to a lower grade, a junk grade, my guess is that their stock will go down another 50%. If they get this downgraded again beyond that, I think they go down another 50%. And then come the questions, my gosh, is, is it going to go under a dollar? Is the number one financial corporation in the United States in 2005 going to go not just under 10 now, but under one dollar? And people say, that doesn't affect the treasuries. Are you kidding me? This is the premier company. That's a fracture. Okay. <clears throat> There's another fracture. I like to focus on domestic and then focus on external. What's going on outside? Well, I had a discussion with The Voice uh, back in June, July, and he said to me, uh, the Chinese are already paying for Saudi oil in RMB currency. So how long has that been going on? He said, oh, several months. I said, they don't, they don't talk about it because uh, bad press for the United States. He said, yeah, well, the impact would be rather severe for the Saudis. They're already under pressure. I said, yeah, they just had $3 trillion of Saudi holdings of treasury bonds stolen by the U.S. government. Now, some people say, well, what do you mean stolen? I said, well, remember in 71 when they set up the petrodollar and the, the recycle of the treasury surplus, the oil surpluses that the Saudis had? I said, well, a lot of that went into treasuries. And I believe, I believe, Paul, I'm not going to call you half dollar. I believe, Paul, that part of the petrodollar scheme that was brokered by a Rockefeller agent named Kissinger, who was appointed to be Treasury Secretary, a Rockefeller agent named Kissinger, I believe the agreement made was you must put half of your treasuries, you Saudi royals, you must put half your treasuries in the U.S. government because we're going to set up a stabilization fund and we're going to use that to keep the world safe and keep the financial markets all stable and healthy and everybody's going to be happy and you Saudi royals will have your wealth secured. It's not secured. We stole it. We're done with the petrodollar. The petrodollar was dismissed by the East and it's going to be buried by the East and it's going to be buried with a big scepter that's golden. So where are we moving? We're going to have to close this. Let me, let me come up with some closing. Uh, and that's coming in 12 to 18 months, Jim. Oh, I don't know. I, I think we've got this dual universe that's going to be taking shape. I'd like to describe it a bit. <clears throat> Western Europe, England, you know, Great Britain, UK, um, Scandinavia, um, 
most of South America, Latin America, Central America, Canada, they're going to continue with the dollar. Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, they're going to continue with the dollar. They're going to be coerced. Look what we're doing with Iran because they wanted to move away from the dollar. We, we sanction them and we, oh gosh, it's very little known. We flood northern Iran with Afghani heroin. We flood it. We make it almost free. We're trying to ruin their society. This is what we do to defend the dollar. It's not honorable. I prefer to go to the gold standard. But as I described, if we back our dollar by gold and we got a $1,300 price, we're going to lose 19,000 tons per year. It's an argument that I'm going to move toward in a minute. It's an argument for 10,000 gold. If we move to 10,000 gold, it's seven times higher. Instead of let's call it 18,000 tons, because the math's easier. Instead of losing 18,000 tons, we lose seven times less, a little under 3,000 tons. That's manageable. We can reindustrialize, manage the trade deficit, bring it down, and maybe the next year it's only 2,000. The gold price rises, the trade deficit drops, and maybe next year it's 1,000. And we're moving toward equilibrium after three or four years. That's what I want to see happen. Instead of starting another war, stealing another country's gold, threatening to attack Venezuela and endorsing the theft of $200 billion worth of Venezuelan assets. That's not in the news. Okay, this dual universe is going to be forced upon the West. We're going to say to Brazil, you know, keep, keep track with the dollar. Don't get off course or we'll kill your leaders. Instead of a gold standard, we have war and killing leaders to sustain, with sanctions, the dollar system. It's not honorable, and it's not sustainable. Okay, there's another factor to, to sustain the dollar. It's Langley itself, our central intelligence agency. Langley has a lot of businesses. Do you think any of them are regulated? No. Okay, what are their businesses? They have a big, big business in narcotics. Papa Bush set it up. Very few people understand. All the objectives of Afghanistan that we heard in the news were phony. Do you remember Condoleezza Rice? She was the NSA director. She said, we're going into Afghanistan to set up an oil pipeline for Chevron. What happened with that? didn't go anywhere. We're going to Afghanistan because they've got tremendous mineral wealth. We're going to aid with the infrastructure development and the mining and all the capital requirements. And we're going to make Afghanistan one of the richest nations in all of Asia. What happened with that plan? Instead, we built up their heroin business. It went from a couple hundred tons to 1,400 tons under our war on terror. What is the war on terror? It's a smokescreen for building up Langley's heroin business. What's the value of Afghan heroin? 800 billion to 1.2 trillion dollars a year. <clears throat> Who covers the costs? The U.S. government, the U.S. military. I've talked as clients to two Hattrick Letter subscribers, ex-U.S. military. They each told me I was doing a tour of Afghanistan. And I said, could you please tell me, what does the high command tell the grunt soldiers in Afghanistan who are guarding the poppy fields, patrolling hundreds if not a thousand US military troop. What do they tell the pardon me, what do they tell the troops? What are they doing? What's all this poppy for? It's clearly for heroin. What do they tell the troops? They both said the same thing. Yes, we're making heroin and we're shipping it to China and Russia to wreck their societies. That's a bunch of bullshit. I got a different hat trick letter client who works and lives at Rammstein, Germany, the NATO base. I said, are we shipping heroin through NATO bases? And he said, yes. 
German Rammstein and Italian Aviano. Those are the two main ports since we lost in Cyrillic in Turkey. And I said, what about shipping it to Russia and China? He said, it's all bullshit. Okay, so we're in the heroin business. <clears throat> Langley's entire heroin business is dollar-based. You think they're going to go off the, gold, uh, off the dollar standard? No, no. No. Okay, Langley has other businesses. Okay, you hear in the news, occasionally the alternative news, that there's $6 trillion in missing Pentagon funds. Where did it go? Well, a lot of it went to Israel, I can assure you, because they are the giant thieves of U.S. weapons. They buy it for scrap metal. I heard that from Cato, my internal source. They steal, like say, a, a destroyer, a naval vessel. They buy it for scrap metal. It's a 90% discount, or 95. <clears throat> the metal is a lot cheaper than the finished product. <clears throat> A lot of weapon systems enter the black market, and Langley is the seller. They take it in dollars. They're not going to go off the dollar standard. Langley is also involved with Papa Bush and the whole team in human trafficking. Okay, if you look closely at the United Nations, you see a lot of coordination toward white woman trafficking. It's in the United Nations which is co-opted by the Rockefeller Foundation. Okay, it's all dollar-based. If you look at the New Jersey hospitals, <clears throat> the Israeli hospitals, and Langley, you see a lot of movement of human organs. It's all dollar-based. I, I read a story about the, the forests outside Kiev. Two years after the launched war in Ukraine, the forest had 2,000 dumped cadavers. It was in the alternative news. What do they have in common? They all had their major organs removed. This is what we do. We create an illicit war. We steal their gold and we take the cadavers from the war and make human organ trafficking, commerce out of it. The point is, Langley has a lot of dollar-based businesses. I heard from The Voice that there are at least a dozen containers in Greek ports that have nothing but shrink-wrapped $100 bills. Langley not only has dollar-based businesses, they have dollar-based savings accounts that are not in banks. The question, you think Langley will apply pressure to continue the dual universe of the dollar in the West and the Chinese RMB in the East? The answer to me is hell yes. So when people think the dollar's going to rise, rise, and as I used to say, but no longer say for the last year, dollar's going to rise, rise, then rise some more and vanish. No, the dollar's going to rise, rise, rise some more, cause tremendous problems and forced upon the United States will be a dual universe where the West with all of its allies will use the dollar under coercion by Langley and the East, including <clears throat> the Pacific Rim, maybe even Japan, big item is Japan, Russia, they're going to use the RMB and the Russian ruble. Now, the Chinese are going to say to the, to the Russians, we'll use your ruble, it's not a problem, and they say, okay, fine. We're going we're gonna to buy some rubles, we're going to support your ruble, we're going to use it in commerce, but it'll all wash out because we're all converting RMB and ruble to gold. Okay, the, the initial pass will be ruble and RMB, and when it comes through the wash, you're going to have gold bars in the banking system in Russia and China. I, I, I was shocked when I read something recently. The strongest economy in the world today, right now, is Russia, despite the sanctions. They're not really having a a big detrimental effect. They're having an effect, but they're working around it. Do any Americans realize that the number one agricultural export nation in the world is Russia? Does anybody realize that in the United States? No, they well, don't. After seeing this interview, you're going to be one of the very few that understand that. And they're selling in rubles. They're converting into dollars. I'm sorry, converting into gold. They're converting all their dollars. They don't have any more treasury bonds. They're converting to gold. Okay, I got another story from The Voice. This is about 
six months ago, a little before Christmas, uh, there was a big story that the, the Russians sold their final $48 billion worth of treasuries and dumped them on the market. And the voice wrote me and said, Jim, here's what really happened. I wouldn't call it a dumping, but it has the same effect for a net basis. What they did was they informed all the Western European banks that the Russian accounts have 40 billion in treasuries and they wanted loans one for one against the treasuries. They wanted to borrow $40 billion and with the 40 billion they bought 40 billion worth of gold. So they're net zero in the Western banks without having sold anything. Hmm. They hmm. borrowed the money. The United States probably set up dollar swaps of 40 billion in volume and the Russians took it and bought gold. They're net zero. They don't give a shit what happens to those banks. If the bank goes down, they don't care. The bank goes down, the debt goes away, the debt is handled maybe in a secondary market, liquidation market. Maybe the bank can take the debt and, and, and turn a profit on it for the liquidation. Okay. One of the biggest events in the United States recently was a General Electric bond downgrade. One of the biggest events in Western Europe was the Deutsche Bank bond downgrade, and their stock's been under $10 for a long time. It used to be $160. Their, their Deutsche Bank stock is down over 90%. General Electric, ditto. Okay, these are your standard bearers. Now you have, okay, let me finish more on the dual universe because I, I got to mention the Italian, the Italian story is wonderful. Um, the dual universe will continue. I, I apologize, I got a very tickly nose. The dual universe will be sustained by China. China is getting all of its trade partners to work in RMB. They're getting all the signatories for Belt and Road Initiative. I just read that they've got rock solid one trillion in active projects, and they got pledges for five trillion more. It's all non-dollar, and all the commerce from setting up, say, a Pakistan gigantic port facility will not be in dollars. The big bridge that they're creating, they're constructing in Thailand, it's going to be one of the world's biggest bridges ever. It will enable more commerce with, with parts of Southeast Asia that, that weren't so accessible, but now it's going to be just quick truck passage. The, the commerce will not be in dollars. <clears throat> Furthermore, a lot of the funding for the Belt and Road Initiative projects sponsored by China will be in dumped treasury bonds in direct exchange. Thailand wants the bridge. Chinese bank funds the project. They provide the treasuries. The, the project uh, contractors in Thailand are organized and they're paid in treasuries and they dump them on the market. The whole East is dumping treasuries. They're doing so for infrastructure projects, for a lot of different things. Okay, and the United States can't stop it. We can't say, oh, we're gonna do trade sanctions against China and all of its partners. Oh, really? And your trade goes down to zero, United States? I don't think so. So we're picking on, we're picking on patsies. We're picking on Russia, we're picking on Iran. Russia is not working. Germany worked around the Russian sanctions by doing something very simple and very clever. They bought up an old Russian plant, retooled it, got it up and running in six to eight months, started shipping product for Russian client consumption. Russian built, Russian subsidiary of Germany, output to the Russian client, no violation of sanctions. United States stepped in and said, oh yeah, oh gosh, that'll take three or four years to get up and running. No, you underestimate the savvy and ability of the Germans. Up and running in six to eight months, and in two years, almost at full capacity. They did it for dozens and dozens of little plants. Now the Germans are saying, we want Nord Stream 2. 
We want the gas from natural gas, and we don't want to buy LNG liquefied natural gas from the United States for 50% higher price. Excuse me, we'd rather buy it from the Russians. And the United States steps in and says, well, we're going to sanction the German financial companies involved. We're going to sanction the German construction companies involved. And the EU court stepped in and said, not legitimate. The Russians and the Germans have a deal. The Germans want it. It makes sense for Germans. It makes sense for the German economy. It's a cheaper source of energy. All of Europe is concluding that Gazprom is a more sensible, cheaper course of action for commerce. And just last week, I got a photo of it in the hat trick letter for March. The last tie in took place for Turkish Stream. We tried to kill their leader, Erdogan. The Russians prevented it and now have a new ally, a former NATO. Well, they're still NATO. <laughs> the Russians captured a NATO nation. And if you think that it's business as usual for all the fighter aircraft at Encirlik Air Force Base, you're just a dumbass. There is something that, again, this, this Rammstein guy pointed out. He said, Jim, you need to be aware of something regarding Encirlik. This has got, got to be a phase out. Uh, there are still some U.S. Air Force fighter aircraft in Encirlik in Turkey, and they depend on the U.S. parts. U.S. made parts. He said, it'll be a few years before we're out of Encirlik. And I said, sounds like Encirlik is two Air Force bases. One is Turkey and one is the United States and, and you know, Germany. And he said, yeah, that's pretty much it. Watch as over time, passage of time, the Turkish part will push out the American part and Encirlik will be 100%, but it's not 100%. You know, it doesn't work that way. He said, it works in percentages, about half-half now. I don't know if that's accurate, but that's what I was told. Okay, <clears throat> now, concluding remark, China is capturing Europe. Remember last year, I think it was September, there was the St. Petersburg Econ Economic Forum. Mm -hmm. Okay, a lot of executives from European companies attended. The United States told them it's a good idea not to go. They told the United States, screw up. They went to the St. Petersburg Economic Forum. I dispute the name Davos Economic Forum. There's no corporate heads there except bankers. Davos, Switzerland is an elite banker barbecue where I believe they got children in the basement for midnight ritual fun. They got an open bar. They probably have a lot of very good drugs. I don't hear of a single, in all my years of the 14 plus years of the hat trick letter, I don't remember a single commercial deal signed at the Davos Economic Forum. All I hear is banking concepts, banking ideas, banking rules discussed, and banking matters. That's all I hear. So the Economic Forum of St. Petersburg is the new Economic Forum. The French attended last year too, and they signed over 20 billion euros worth of deals with Russian firms. During the Russian sanctions, European companies signed oodles and oodles of billion dollar deals with Russian firms. During the Russian sanctions. So, <clears throat> the Economic Forum of St. Petersburg is the new Economic Forum. In fact, it's the only big economic forum, and Putin attends it and sprinkles Russian holy water on it, where it burns all the Satanist Western corporate leaders' faces. That's a big statement I just made. I've had numerous comments sent to me, few from Canada, where they observed satanic rituals by their corporate leaders, mm. early morning or late at night, and I, I'll just leave it at that. Okay, so China bought Greek ports in the last two years. The Greeks were looking to sell their prized assets, remember? The Greeks were 
objecting to the Germans sacking control through collateral seizure from debt failure, the Germans were seizing assets. And there are only so many you can seize to cover tens of billions of euros. I mean, the port facility might have been worth two, okay? You take over an entire string of shopping malls and you might have one and a half. So how do you seize like 50 billion? It's very difficult. So the Greeks were looking to sell some assets, gain partnerships, you know, like sell 40% interest. I don't honestly know, but I believe the Chinese own more than controlling interest of the Petraeus port. And, and now they went on a shopping tour to Italy. And I included this in the Hattrick letter for March. It was a dynamo story because the U.S. government tried to influence the Italian prime minister and vice prime minister not to entertain any deals with China. And the Italians said, this will not interfere with our alliance with the United States. This will not interfere or undermine our arrangements with NATO. So we will proceed. And now on the table, our memorandum of understanding to buy four port, up to four ports. The four ports are Trieste, Ravenna, Genoa, and Palermo, Sicily. And I'm not an expert in the geography of Italy. I don't know. I think Genoa, Ravenna, I'm not sure. I think they're all on the Adriatic coast. Now, if they're smart, they would have gotten one on the other coast. The coast was Sardinia. Hmm. But the point is, they signed a deal amidst U.S. objections. And the deal will proceed, I believe, because the Italians have a, their own vested interest. In the same statement that says they're going to proceed, the Italian leaders are saying, <clears throat> we want Italy to be a vital port for Chinese trade that affects the U.E., economy. They're going to be rivaling Greece, and it'll be good for the Italian economy. We're slowly seeing key nations in the European Union move toward the West, I'm sorry, move toward China and the East. I, we call it flipping East. Germany is flipping East. They're fed up with the United States trying to run their country. They're a vassal state, and they know it, and they're trying to cut this, trying to change certain contractual obligations where it's institutionalized their, their vassal state status. And, and uh, the Nord Stream 2 deal, I think, is going to be critical in fracturing some of the control lines from Washington to Berlin. But the Italians are so defiant. I love the Italians. I, I, when I was in Boston before I left, I had three best friends who were Italian. They all had Italian-sounding names. They're fun guys. We Irish like the Italians. We're both outspoken. We're, we're hot, hot-blooded. We're emotional. We, we, we never just, oh, well, that's okay. No, no, it's, I don't like that. You know, we, we stand up for ourselves. And the Italians, the Italians are on record two years ago, three years ago. We're not going to let the EU commission do to Italy what they did to Greece. So they're setting up commerce and they're trying to improve their economy. I believe Italians are going to break loose and, and revert to the lira, the lira currency. And it's going to cause some very serious problems because it's not just a matter of one country exiting. The entire euro currency must be rejiggered and all the contracts must be rewritten because there are, I think, 13 members and they all have their ratios and it's all in contract. It all has to be rewritten. I once thought it would be a simple matter. It's not. I got correct. I like to learn. Paul, I like to Ladies and gentlemen, Jim Willie, editor of the Hat Trick Letter, what we're listening to is that the death of the dollar is written in stone. In the meantime, we're seeing the rise of a dual universe. And one of these universes is on the rise. One of them is in decline. And we'll let the listener figure out which one that is. Jim Willie, parting thoughts? The dual universe is going to have a gradual encroachment by the East into the West to install the gold standard. And I believe Europe is critical. 
Europe is far more important than Brazil and Venezuela. They're important in Latin America, to be sure, but Europe is the key. If Europe begins to flip more and more east and, and the Frankfurt, uh, Frankfurt RMB uh, hub is developed for bond issuance and currency trading, we're going to see even more impetus. If we see German construction and finance firms involved in Belt and Road Initiative projects, it's going to accelerate. The Chinese are going to eventually capture Europe. Europe is starting to hate the United States, hate our influence, hate our orders, hate our sanctions. You cannot sanction the Germans. You cannot do that. And if you do, you're going to have an acceleration during this dual universe phase toward the gold implementation in the West. I think the United States is going to be last in the gold standard. And we're, we're at the risk of flipping into the third world. Our infrastructure is now very close to third world in description. So dual universe is going to be the rule of the day while the gold standard makes its impact. First with the gold trade note, with oil shipments and payments, then in shipments for grain and, and you know, hard items like cement, lumber, coal, metals, and then an international contract. The gold trade note will make the big inroad and implement the early stages of the gold standard. And the United States will be forced into this game in order to assure import supply. Because the import of the exporters from other countries, those who export from their country to the United States, are going to demand the gold trade note. They're going to start refusing the U.S. Treasury bill. And it's going to be a, a big, hot dispute because we're going to pressure them. And we're going to do strange things like harm their economy, harm their financial markets, and maybe even target their leaders to get them to accept the Treasury bill in trade. This is how it's, this is how it's evolving. You've got tons of precedent.